I'm Steve Hastings. This is Elegant and Efficient Python. Um, this is my first time giving a presentation at one of these things, so hopefully I will be okay for you guys. I've tried to make an interesting presentation. Um, so let's start doing it. Um, Python is my favorite language. It combines power with expressiveness. Um, you can do powerful, high-level things, yet the code, if it's written properly, is almost like pseudocode. You know, it's almost like you're describing in English what you want, and it just happens to run. Um, Python has a whole bunch of useful, cool stuff built in, and a lot of writing elegant and efficient Python is taking advantage of the useful and cool stuff that's built in. Um, Python, the, in the community, we talk about Pythonic code. Pythonic means taking advantage of the features of Python. Um, it's Pythonic if you're, if you're using the built-in features effectively and kind of writing code the, the Python way. And um, there's a bunch of common idioms in Python uh, that everybody likes to use. And these idioms tend to be efficient, because if they weren't efficient, nobody would want to use them. Um, This is not going to be a talk about um, proper style, like how many spaces to put around the plus sign in an expression or things like that. Um, there are guides like that. Um, the style guide is PEP8. PEP stands for Python Enhancement Proposal, I believe. Um, and anytime they want to improve the language, they publish a PEP. So 8 was one of the earliest ones, and that's just uh, a style guide. So. Um, I definitely approve of PEP8. And then there's the famous Zen of Python, which everybody should read. Um, it's actually built into Python as an Easter egg. Uh, if you type import this, it prints the Zen of Python, which is uh, about 20 different rules, like beautiful is better than ugly. Um, and I didn't put them all on the slide because it would be busy. So we're done with that. Um, if you would like to just learn Python idioms in general, not just my, the ones I'm talking about. There's a few other sources. The best one is Code Like a Pythonista by Ben Goodger. That is a fantastic uh, presentation. And he just talks about um, all kinds of little idioms in Python to make sure that you know about them. Um, and there's a guy named Raymond Hettinger. If you could trade me for him, you'd like to do it. He's a very engaging speaker. Um, he's one of the Python core developers. He's the author of like the Iter Tools module, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and you can see his talk, Transforming Code into Beautiful Idiomatic Python, um, on YouTube. Um, and that is uh, a fun one to watch. So enough about other people. Let's get on with this. Um, Python, while it is my favorite language, is not the most efficient language inherently. Like, C is kind of the, regarded as like the best you can do. C or like assembly code, but nobody writes assembly too much these days. Um, Python is in fact written in C because C is fast. Python is about roughly 50 times slower than C. Does that mean your program is going to be 50 times slower than a C program? No, it does not. Because if you're using the built-in features and Python's library modules, your code can be fast. Python has a wonderful library of stuff. A lot of it's written in C. Some of it's even written in Fortran. People are doing serious math in Python. Statistics, engineering stuff, simulations. You can do it in Python. Um, you're just relying on the underpinnings that are written in C or Fortran or whatever to do a lot of the work for you. So this is why I say the code you don't write is the fastest code sometimes. You would be crazy to write your own matrix multiply in Python. Just use the built-in matrix multiply, and that'll be nice and fast. So this is an example of writing too much versus not writing too much. Um, the first loop is written kind of the way a C programmer would write it, because in C, that's kind of how you have to do it. Um, in C, the for loop is just kind of used for general looping. And if you have a variable like i, it's being incremented and then you use your variable i to look up something from an array. So the first one looks like the way uh, a C developer would do it. But it's making Python work too hard. 
Um, every time we use the, the square bracket with i, we are indexing the array, the, or the, the list, I should say, the Python list. Um, this is not the end of the world, especially since there's only three colors. But the second loop does exactly what we want. What we want is to print the various colors. And the for loop is really kind of a for each. A for loop is going to set the variable to different successive values, in this case, the values from the uh, list. Um, so if you just want the values, loop over the list directly and don't index the list needlessly. So only you can prevent needless indexing. Um, sometimes you don't need a loop at all because there's built-ins that do cool things. Um, sum would be a useful one for adding things up. Any and all are favorites of mine. Any would return true if any of the values that it looks at are true. And all returns true if all of the values it looks at are true. And I'll have some examples with any in a bit. Um, so this is kind of a trivial example. I don't know if, I don't know how often it actually happens that somebody would go to the trouble to write a loop with total um, when they could just be using sum. Um, but I think it's clear one line replaces, we have four lines on the top, we have one line on the bottom, and I like the one line better. But here's an example that I have seen a lot. When you, when you need to sum just part of a list, we're just so used to looping to count things. I know I, know I am. Um, so you, you, if you want to sum part of a list, your impulse is to do some kind of a loop and accumulate as you go. Whereas in Python, we have slicing. So slicing is with the, the, the colon. So we have an, uh, up to three things in slicing notation. The first thing is the start. And if you leave it out, it starts at 0, the first thing. In the, the second one would be the end, and here we're going to end with num elements, and then the optional third one would be some kind of a step, like if you wanted every other one, you could use a step of two. So the, the second one is going to do the exact same thing as the first one. It will be faster, and it's less code to write. Um, can I sure. Right. If we're, if we're using the full list, it's first the start, yes. then the stop, and then the step. So like if you wanted all the odd, like 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, you could use a start of 1 and a stop of either the end or you could just leave it out because if you leave it out, you get to all the way to the end, okay. and then a step of 2. Um, so in slice notation, it's always colons. So it'd be, uh, if you're using the start, it goes first, and then there's a colon. Then the, the end goes, and then there's a colon, and then there's the, the step. Also be colon two. Right, right. That's right. I, I apologize. I should have put more in on the slide about slicing. I should have had just a discussion of slicing in general. Um, is, is, is everybody OK? Can I move on? OK, cool. Now here's another example of slicing. You can actually reverse with slicing. By using a negative step, um, it will actually, with a negative step, it kind of reverses. So the start would be like the last one, and the end would be like the first one. And again, if you just leave them out, it does sensible defaults. So, so if you want the whole list, but stepped in reverse order, you can just leave the first two empty and then put a step of minus one. Um, so again, you don't need to say for i in um, range of length of the thing, comma, 0, comma, minus 1, you know, to get a range that steps down from the length. You can do it with uh, the slice. Uh, since reversing things is kind of handy, there's actually a built-in, reversed. So you can just say for color in reversed colors. And you're saying what you mean, and it's nice and efficient. So Python has this notion of an iterator. And in, in Python, everything's an object. Like if you have an integer, it's an object. An iterator is another kind of an object. And what Python knows how to do with an iterator is pull values out of it one at a time. 
So there's a, a method on the iterator which is called next. And because Python's a little bit funny about some of these methods, it's actually underscore, underscore, next, underscore, underscore. Because the secret hidden me method functions that you don't usually directly use have the, the underscores around them. Um, so every time you call next on an iterator, it pops a value out. And when you do it one time too many and there are no more values left, then the iterator raises a special exception called stop iteration. So at the top, we have a nice simple for loop. Um, at the bottom, this kind of shows what's really going on inside of Python. Now, obviously, Python is not binding a variable called my iterator. Um, it's just a nameless iterator inside the for loop. But we get an iterator, and then we can use next to pull values out of it one at a time. And as we pull the values out, we can print them, so we're inside an infinite while loop. And then finally, when stop iteration is raised, we catch that exception and we break out of the loop. So I don't suggest you actually write your loops this way, but I think iterators are good to understand. So summary of iterators. If you get an object. When you call next on it, you get an, another value out. When it's done, it raises stop iteration. An important thing is that you can pull a value out, and then you can kind of leave it alone, and you can come back to it later and pull another value out. It remembers where you were. Um, so we're going to do some stuff with that. So just to reiterate, coming from the Perl, <laughs> so you can, you can never go out of bounds in the rain in Python. You never have to worry about that. So I'm so used to checking and setting the limit. Or... If you try to go out of the bounds of an array, it will raise an exception. So if you try to index the list with an, with, uh, an out of bounds index, then it will raise an exception. And if you just do these direct loops like I'm showing, you'll never have to worry about how long it is because you just get the right number. It doesn't matter, it's 10, 100,000, a million. That's true. Well, your program says stop because it raises an exception. Yeah, yeah so if you, if, if, if you do raise an exception and you didn't catch it, your program will be stopped. Okay. If you do catch the exception, you can do whatever you want. You can ignore it, you can re-raise it, um, you can so print a message. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in Python, we don't generally have to write that kind of code. If you're looping over the values in a list, you just loop over them. And, um, and um, I, I don't actually have a slide about this, but a lot of the time in Python, the way you handle errors is by not handling them. It's kind, kind of zen. Like, if it's, if it's a weird error, and when it happens, your program should stop because you didn't expect that, and you don't know what's going on, you don't trust it to keep running, you could catch the error, print a message, and then say sys.exit and shut the program down. Or you could just not catch it, in which case Python will take your program down for you and it will print a stack backtrace showing you exactly the line where the problem occurred. So um, for, like, uh, for like a production system that was supposed to be running 24 hours a day and never stop, you need to catch every exception. You have to be very careful. But for little one-off programs you knock out, a lot of the time you just don't check for errors. You just let the exceptions happen and let them take your program down, and it's actually very convenient. You can look right at it and say, oh, there's my problem, and it has the line that the problem was on because it shows the stack backtrace. <coughs> Here's an example where we, we know perfectly well that at some point stop iteration is going to get raised. And we don't want our program to crash. We just want to stop looping. Right. Um, so I mean, this is a silly example because you have the built-in for. Right. But this shows an example of we know stop iteration is a possibility, and we handle it. But my, my question was, is there a time when you actually would use this method? Oh, yes. Um, I'll have examples later where we're expecting exceptions and we catch them. Well, okay. Um, but in the case of looping, I mean, you've got, you can already do this for each over your oh, well, so in the region of file. This isn't an example of why I want you to catch an exception. This is just an example of making an iterator. Now, moving on to the next slide, here is an example of when you might actually want to do this technique. So what we have here, we have... <coughs> This is a little bit of a contrived example, but it's kind of like parsing like a binary file. 
um, we have a list and it has a bunch of values we don't care about. And then there's a special value, which in my example is my header. Once we see that, now we're interested. Um, and after we've seen that, the next value is some kind of account, and then we want to pull out that many values from the list and then stop. Now, to do this kind of wacky processing, we're doing several things. We're skipping things until we detect the header, we skip the header as well, then we pull out a count, and then we pull out just the, that many values. So having the explicit iterator is handy because the explicit iterator keeps track of where we are. So the first loop loops until it finds the header. Then that loop stops as soon as we found the header because we call break. The iterator remembers our place. The iterator knows where we are. So it, it's now the next value that's going to pop out is the count. So we can use next to explicitly just pop one value out um, and there I'm converting it. I'm assuming that it was like some kind of a, a, a string that's like our number and I convert it to int. And then finally, um, we have a loop that, that loops with 4x in my iterator, so it's going to pull values out with the loop directly. And then I'm using the count to count down um, and, until I need to stop. Um, we could also write this loop the other way. We could say for like i in range of count and use the loop to do the counting and then just use next to pull the values out. Um, so this, this, the example of, of a list with weird things in it is a little bit contrived, but you can write code like this when parsing files and things. And um, I often find that it's just simpler to use the, the iterator like this. If you don't make your own iterator, if you just did 4x in my list, then as soon as you break out of that loop, you've lost your place. Now, I wanted just to stop and talk about jargon for a minute. I, keep, I think I've already used the word iterable a bunch. Uh, and iterable just means something that can be iterated. If you can iterate it, it's iterable. Um, once you make an explicit iterator, like I showed on this slide, that's called an iterator. An iterable is something that can be iterated. An iterator is an object which you can use the iterator protocol on and, and call next. Um, so this slide is just to make the point that when you open a file, you get an iterator. So you don't even have to call iter to get an iterator. The file handle object is an iterator. So um, if you knew you wanted to throw away three lines, you can just loop um, for a variable in range of three next f, and it would throw away three lines from that file handle. You could also just use the file.reline method function, which would be equivalent in this case. Um, but it's one of the cool things in Python that a file handle is an iterator that when you iterate it, you get lines out from the file. Um, and by the way, this is the underscore is a legal variable name, and there's kind of a convention in Python that you use it for variables where you don't care about them. I have a loop here. It's going to count from 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, and then stop. But I don't use the count number for anything. I don't care about the count number. I just want it to loop three times. And so because of that, I'm using the underscore just so that when somebody reads my code, they know, oh, don't, don't care. So we pull our three values out. And then the, the, the other loop, we're going to do something with every, every line of the, of the uh, file. Uh, and this is similar to the other thing. Suppose you had a file that contained a header line. Again, we can just loop on it until we find the header, break out of that loop, and then we're, we've, we've kept our place. Yes? So uh, what if I want to treat the file as a bit stream? Um, like, how do I change modes from lines to bytes or bits? Or um, can I work on that level? You can work on that level. Um, the the built-in file object is always going to give you a line but you could write your own, some sort of iterator thing. You'd use what's called a generator, and generators are like the last one third of the talk. So you could write a generator that would use a binary file read to pull binary out and then give it to you one byte at a time or whatever's convenient. So this is an example of code that is neither elegant nor efficient. And I've seen code like this in the wild far too often. Um, we have a special first value that we're going to pull out, and then we're going to do something special with it, and then every other value is different. 
And so they'll, you, you have this flag, first pass, which starts out true. And then on your first pass, you, you do something special and then set the flag to false. And then every other loop, you're doing the second case. So every single time it loops, it has to run this if to check if the first pass flag is true or not. And it's just silly. There's no reason for it. We can pull a value out with next. And then if you just want to take the remaining ones and make a list out of them, you can just pass the iterator to the list class constructor thing there, and it will turn it into a list. If you, if you just pass an iterator to list, it will pull values from the iterator until it's exhausted and build a list out of it. So this, these three lines does the same work as all of that. And it does it without the, ex, the needless extra variable of first pass. Yes? So that, So you don't have to dump it into my list. You don't have to make a list out of it. If you just don't do that, then the, the iterator, the, the F in this example, it's an iterator where you can pull the values out oh, one at a time. The header is just, that, that header line is just going to reverse or grow. Yeah. That takes the reverse and still have the iterator. <coughs> yeah, so um, okay. that's the rule of an iterator. When you call them next on it, it pops a value out. Okay. And if there are no more values to pop out, it raises stop iteration. So in this case, we pop the header out, and then the iterator remembers your place. So it now, every time you call next on it, or, or read line, or whatever, you'll get it. And you could call like the read method to get it all at once. Uh, there's a lot of methods for, for reading from a file handle. So yeah, this is just an, so in this example, I'm showing somebody making an empty list and then looping to append to it. Um, I don't know why, they want the stuff in a list. But here, this just shows you can do it in one go. But you don't have to, obviously. Quick question. Sure. Let me just change this a bit. I just want the 20th record to look into the code. Not sure about anything else. Well, um, here we wanted just the fourth line and the lines after it, so we skipped three. Oh, OK. So here, um, you could do like four underscore in range of 20 and throw away 20 lines. So iterators remember your place. There's Well, slicing works on lists, but it's funny you should mention this. There is something very much like slicing that works on iterators. It's called iSlice, and you get it from a module called iterTools. And I'm going to have an example for you. <laughs> so this is working. I'm happy. Um, so iterTools, um, it's just loaded with, it, it has like uh, about 20 different uh, functions you can call, and they're all kind of neat. And whenever I have something that needs to be fast, I look at iterTools to see if there's something in there that could help me. Um, so here is our same example with iter tools. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to skip values. And iter tools has a thing called drop while. Drop while will drop values while a condition is true. So in order to tell the iter tools drop while about the condition you want, you have to pass in some kind of like a function object. So we're defining a function called before header, which returns true if we haven't seen the header. And it will return false when we hit the header. So then drop while is going to drop values from the iterator until that returns true. And then drop while um, doesn't actually throw away the special value. It, it, it keeps it. It must be putting it back somehow because you have to pop it out with next. Um, anyway, um, so we have to explicitly call next to drop the, uh, the header. Um, so then all we have to do is just like before, we can call next on my iterator to get the count. And then at the last, there's iSlice. So we give it the iterator, and then we give it the count. And iSlice then gives you a new iterator that will give you count items exactly and then stop. 
and um, the the, fi the file could have like any number of things, file or iter whatever. The iterable could be any size, um, and that iterator with uh, I slice will only give you the number that you asked it for. So um, here's a, here's kind of a funny thing though. We're defining this function before header. And really, that's a silly function. It does one thing. We're never going to call it again. We have no use for this other than as a thing to feed the drop while. So Python has this thing called Lambda. And Lambda is a, it comes from Lambda calculus. And people in the Lisp world would talk about Lambda functions and so on. So that's why the funny keyword Lambda. But Lambda just means define a function object that evaluates an expression. So the rule is it can only be one expression. If you need more than one expression, then you just have to define a function. Just use the normal function defined. But here in this case, it is so simple. All we care about is checking that x is not the special header. We can do it with lambda. Now, I'm, instead of assigning it to this name here, we're going to pass it in directly. So that's the, the line I've, I've put in the different color. Um, instead of making an actual function with a name and passing it to drop while, we're making the function right in place with lambda. And it's just a little function with no name, but we pass it to drop while, and drop while can evaluate it. And otherwise, this slide is exactly like the previous slide. So everybody's OK with lambda? Let's move on. I just want to say before we leave lambda that it's not better or cool. So. I've seen, like, cube equals lambda. It's like, if it needs a name, just define it with a name. Do it the usual way. End of rant. <laughs> <laughs> Another quick detour into jargon. Python, everything is objects. And in a lot of language, you'd think of declaring a variable. Like in C, you need to declare a variable with its type so it knows how much space to allocate. In Python, everything's an object. If you just say three, there's going to be an object, 3, hanging around. So instead of de declaring a variable of x, what we're really doing is we're binding the name x to hold on to a reference to some object. So in this example, we're, we're making a string object that contains the value example. We're binding it with the name x. Then in the next line, we bind the name y to the exact same object that x is bound to. Because when you use the name x, you get, you get back the reference that x is holding on to. And th so if we say x is y, and we check object identity, we have identity. They are the same object. x and y are, have the same object reference. Because strings can't be changed in place, if we use the plus equals operator to add an exclamation mark onto the end, Python has to create a new string object. So then it's a new object. Python rebinds the name x to point to it. And now if we say x is y, it's not true anymore. And so that leads me into talking about mutable versus non-mutable. Um, mutable objects can have their state changed. Immutable objects cannot, and strings are immutable. So like I just said, if you wanted to change a string, Python makes a new string. And then if you, if you, if some, if, if you don't have a reference saved anywhere to the old string, then it would be garbage collected. It would just be deleted. Um, but in the first example, we make a list, and then we append to the list. And my list holds the same reference in both cases. We have just mutated the list. I promised you would learn to use the word mutate non-ironically. So we talk all the time about mutating or immutable in Python. Like in, I'm going to skip ahead to this example. We're trying to iterate and mutate at the same time, and it doesn't work. Um, so say we, we have a function is bad that tells us whether a key is bad. I don't know what that would might be. Maybe it's a bad word. I don't know. But we want to take all the bad keys out of the dictionary. The first example doesn't work because we're trying to iterate the dictionary at the same time we're trying to delete things out of it. And Python will just raise an exception saying you can't mutate a dictionary while you're iterating it. Um, so the second one, we just use list to explicitly make a copy of all the keys. If you say list on a dictionary, what you get is a list of the keys of the dictionary. So this list will be used once just for the for loop and then allowed to be deleted. Um, so the second one works and the first one doesn't. Um, 
I wanted to talk about command query separation, but just for a minute. Um, this is something that confuses people in Python. Um, the idea of command query separation is you shouldn't be mutating things by accident. You should know when you're mutating and when you're not. And so at, it's a rule in Python. Everything built into Python, if it mutates an object, returns none. And this confuses people. They say, I want to sort the list. And so you say, like, y equals list.sort. But it doesn't work because y just gets set to none. Well, that's because the dot sort method function sorts a list in place. So it's mutating the list. So according to the rules, list.sort returns none. Whereas we have another built-in called sorted. And sorted does not mutate the list, but returns a new list, which is sorted. So because sorted returns a list, you know it doesn't mutate the object that you give it. Because list.sort mutates the object you give it, you know it returns none. Yes? Is that a convention, or is it forced by the language somehow? It is a convention. You can so write code that mutates and then returns a copy, and I've seen it. I've, I've written well, it. Well, it, it just depends on what the return value of the sort function is. If the return value of the sort function is, <coughs> is void, then you're not going to return it. You just look at my list again. You're just calling a method on an object. Right, so, so he's asking if this right, command query right. separation is a convention or if it's enforced somehow, and it's not enforced. It it's a convention. How you write it as a it, it's, it's just a convention. It's just how you write your code. All the built-ins obey it. Yes? Um, it's, it's so you don't accidentally think you're doing one when you're doing the other. It's just a convention to help you reason about your programs. If you, if you, if you, if you know that sorted is returning a list, you can count on that sorted will not mutate the list you pass it. That's all it is. It's just, it's just a convention to help you reason about programs. They, they don't actually have a naming convention. They just have this command query thing of returning none. Um, so, whether it's a copy of the list. so I have a bunch of functions that say mutate in place. What's the corollary non-mutating function that returns a copy? How, how would I be able to figure out what that is? Well, the, the Python has two that I can think of, sorted and reversed. And there they have this kind of ED convention on the end. It's returning a sorted copy or returning a reversed copy. You could use that. Also, the first one is a method function on the object. You're telling the object to mutate itself. Um, whereas the, if you're not mutating the object, we, we have just a, a function that we call. And again, that's just a, a convention, I guess. You could, have, um, you could have a method function on your object that returns a, a copy of it. Let, let's, let's move on. It's enough of that. Um, I, I, I want to get to the end of the slides without rushing too much. I'm, n I'm new at this. I'm sorry. Um, so I hope you enjoy this example as much as I do because there's about six slides of counting things in a dictionary. Um, hopefully when we get to the end, you'll, you'll think it was worth it. Um, so we have a problem. We have a list of names, and we want to get a dictionary with counts. So like if, if the name... Steve is in the dictionary twice. We want the count to be Steve colon two in the dictionary. Now, key is Steve, count is two, the, the value is two in the dictionary. So we'll have a bunch of keys of the names and a bunch of counts. So this is an example of using an exception <coughs> handler to, to solve this problem. When we start off the dictionary is empty. If we try to, in, if we try to use the key with the dictionary um, and then add to it, we're going to get a key error because the dictionary is guaranteed to be empty. So we catch the key error, and then on the second one, we explicitly set a starter value of 1. I don't think this is actually a very good way to solve this problem, because we're going to be having exceptions all over the place. Every time we see a new name, we have to handle an exception. But this is a legal way to do it, and there's a name for this technique. It's called easier to ask forgiveness than get permission. <laughs> now, in this case, I think it's easier to get permission first. And all the other examples are going to work that way. But, in, but the, the, the meme is called easier to ask for forgiveness than get permission. And the actual alternative strategy to this is called look before you leap. So let's look before we leap. We'll say if the name is not in the dictionary, 
we'll set in a starter value of zero, and after that, we'll go ahead and just increment the count. So this is, I think, a, a little cleaner, and this is the most straightforward way to write this in Python. But we can get a little trickier. Dictionaries have a method called setDefault, and setDefault will set a default value if it's not already set. So if the name's not set, we set in a starter value of zero, and if the name is, is set, we leave it alone and don't change it, and then after that we increment it. I think this one's kind of tricky. I don't like set default that much. What I like better is get. Get works pretty well. You say get me the thing with the key that's name, and if it's not in there, use a default value of zero. So now we have uh, a nice short loop that's pretty easy to understand. You'll see this a lot in Python code. Um, so instead of doing the explicit check to see if the key's in there, we just use the get method with a default value to show what we want to do if the, if the key's not in there. So we're, we're getting more elegant, I think. But wait. <laughs> yes. The collections module has a, a special kind of a dictionary called default dict. And I think this is another Raymond Hettinger one, I believe. Um, with default dict, you give it some kind of a callable function object that, when called with no arguments, gives you some kind of a default value. So you can pass like a string to int, and it will turn it into an int for you. But if you pass nothing in, you just get back a zero. So the default dict here, if the name isn't in there, it sets a zero in for you, and then we can increment it past that. This is kind of neat. But actually, counting is a common problem. So Python just gives you collections.counter. You can't beat it now. Now it's one line. It's just do what I want. Yes? So it won't help me with character rich because it's only in 3.7. That's right. But I have some code which only works on Python 3.7 because I couldn't be bothered doing not using count because <laughs> it's so helpful. Right. So um, counter is new. So it's in 2.7 for the 2.x series. and it might be in 3.0, I'm not sure, but it, it might not be in every one of the 3.x series as well. But it's, it's so nifty. If you don't have it, this one's commonly available. And if you have to use a wacky old version of Python that doesn't even have that, I would probably do that, just to be safe. But a point I want to make is that counter works with any kind of an iterator. If, if, if you have any kind of an iterator or iterable, like a list of things or a, an iterator returning values, Counter will step through all of them, counting as it goes, building the dictionary for you. So list comprehensions were a big deal when they were added to the language. A list comprehensions is, lists are in square braces. So you could make a list by listing things set off with commas in square braces. Here we have square braces that have a kind of a formula in it that describes what we want. So there's three parts. There's the expression at the beginning, which in this case is x star star 2, which is the Python way to say x raised to the power of 2 or x squared. Uh, then we have a for part. We say 4x in data. And then we have the if part, which is optional, where we decide a, a filter on which values to keep. So in this case, for some strange reason, we want to have the squares of only the integer valued numbers from data. So 1.2 has a fraction, we don't want it. 2 doesn't have a fraction, we do want it, and so on. So our test is if x is equal to the integer value of x, and if you say int of 1.2, it'll throw away the 0.2 and give you back a 1. And so that will fail that test. But 2 doesn't have a fraction, and if you pass it in, you'll just get the 2 back. So that will pass that test. So this will work. If we run this, we get the list as shown of 4, 9, and 16. This is so elegant, just a little bit of stuff in one line, and it kind of makes the list you want. It replaces more code. When this first appeared, people started using it all over the place for everything. Um, and as a result of that, they, they added the, more stuff to the language, such as dictionary comprehensions, where you, instead of square braces, you use the curly braces. And instead of an expression returning one value, you have an expression with two expressions separated by a colon. So you're, generating a key and a value. And so in this example, we're, we want to make a dictionary that maps A onto 1, B onto 2, C onto 3, and so on, all the way through Z onto 26. So we're, we're mapping letters of the alphabet with numbers. 
maybe because we have a, a, a cipher we wrote when we were eight years old and we want to make a little key to look it up. Um, so the four part, we don't have an if part in this one, but the four part, we, we have I stepping from the numbers 0 through 25. And then we can, ORD takes the, takes, gives you an integer representing that character. So we take the integer for A, add a number to it, and then convert it back to a, to a, a, a character with CHR. So that makes all of our characters. Um, so that's a dictionary comprehension. We also have set comprehensions. Um, you still use the curly braces, but the expression is just one value instead of a value, a colon, and another value. And then it makes a Python set. So for some reason, we want a set of what letters in Python are not in the word pot. Um, that's enough of that. But let's talk about generator expressions. I love generator expressions. You're going to see a lot of slides about these. Since um, everybody loved list comprehensions, they were using them a lot. And they were needlessly building lists that were then being torn down. You use the list once. Say you, say you want to sum a bunch of numbers. Say you want the sum of these numbers. You could use the, the list comprehension. It would build the list. Then you sum the numbers in the list. And then you let the list be deleted. Why needlessly build a list and then tear it down? Let's just get the values. So a generator expression does the same thing as a list comprehension, but rather than building the list, it just gives you an iterator. And so we can call next on the object and pop the values out one at a time, and then the last one would raise stop iteration, just like we've seen earlier. We can do a lot with these. So another neat thing is that so the, the generate expressions, you use parentheses for the expression instead of the square braces. They fixed the compiler for Python so that if you're calling a function anyway and the function has parentheses, usually you can just let those parentheses be the parentheses you're using. So we can call the sum function here, and we put the, the generator expression inside as the thing to be summed, and it works. So you don't need to needlessly type extra parentheses. So this is an example of computing root mean square. We're going to square a bunch of values and then sum all the squares, divide it by the length to get the uh, arithmetic mean, and then take the square root of the mean. That's root mean square. So um, here's another example, um, just kind of reminding you that, that file handles are iterators. In this case, we want to sum a bunch of numbers that are in a file. They're one number per line. But they're in text, so we need to convert them to integer first. So instead of just passing in the file handle to sum, we have a generate expression where we're calling int on each line. And int will um, do the right thing with spaces and the new line, so this will work. So this is an example of the file gives us close to what we want, but not exactly what we want. And we can use the generate expression as kind of an adapter to get exactly what we want for the sum. Now, you'll notice this would only work if there was one number per line. Uh, later on, we'll have an example that works with any number of numbers per line. It kind of, but, but this is a very simple example here. Now, this is kind of, kind of Well, let me just explain it. The first one, we want to count how many lines in a file are not blank. If it's blank, we don't count it. If it's non-blank, we want to count it. I, I would use code like this to try to find how many non-blank lines of code I've written. Because um, I, I use a lot of white space, extra lines, and I don't want to count those in, in, in code counts. So we can count one for each line if the line is not blank. When you say line.strip, it will throw away all the white space, spaces, tabs, the new line at the end. If you're left with nothing, that was a blank line. And um, if you say if on the empty string, it evaluates false. So we'll count one for each non-blank line. But here is the weird kind of interesting way to do it, the second example. We're passing a Boolean value, a true or false value, to sum. And it works, because the Boolean class is a subclass of integers. And true is a constant for 1, 
and false is a constant for zero. So we're actually summing one for each true flag and zero for each false flag, which does what we want. So can something be sleazy and elegant at the same time? Because <laughs> that's kind of how I feel about this. It's like we're, we're passing Booleans and we're not even typecasting them. We're not coercing them at all. We're just letting them like, oh, they're secretly ints. Um, I, I like this. I actually do this a lot. It's just less typing. You can do the first one, do the explicit one, but the second one is just a little less typing, and I'm pretty lazy. So, so this is taking account of all the lines that are not blank. That is correct. And again, um, you were asking, I think it was you asking earlier about laziness. This is really lazy. We look at each line, and when we're done with it, we let go of it. We're not saving them in a list or anything. So this, this could be a file with a million lines, and all you need is enough memory for one line at a time, basically. So I, I apologize if anyone is shocked by the bad language on this slide. <laughs> but um, I wanted to show an example of using any with a generator expression. So we're make, we, we have our list of the bad words that must never be said. And uh, we're going to make a list by splitting a string. And then we're going to see if any of these bad words appears anywhere in the string. Um, so any kind of has an implicit loop. And then the generator expression kind of has a loop. So this is actually kind of like a doubly nested loop all in one clean line. I love this. You can overdo it. I don't recommend this. This is a mess. Ick. What if you, what if you wanted to do this kind of parsing, though? There, there might be a way coming in a slide or two. And finally, I've seen this. Somebody calls sum and they pass in a list comprehension. Well, all you have to do is take out the square braces and it still works and it will be more efficient and a little bit more elegant because instead of making a list that is used once for summing the numbers and then deleted, you can instead make a generator expression that will pop the values out one at a time. So now, we've talked about generator expressions, let's talk about generators. Generators are so awesome, I think. Um, when you use the keyword yield, you have made a generator. So the way this works is we write a function that's seemingly like any other function, and we can think the way we normally like to think, like looping. We can write a loop that will make all the values we want, but whenever it encounters the word yield, it will stop. It will produce one value at that point, and then it will sit there waiting for somebody to ask it for another value which is really, really neat. So this gen range example, we just write a simple loop that will produce the values we want to produce, but we yield them. So it runs just enough to yield up one value and then it stops. And it doesn't even do that until somebody calls next. So somebody calls next, it runs, pops out one value and then stops. Somebody calls next again, it runs just enough to pop out another value. And it will keep doing that um, so then I've made the while loop, um, it counts up to the stop value, and then the function is done. It falls out the bottom of the loop. The generator will automatically at that point raise stop iteration. So here is a word counting generator. Or no, sorry, this is a non-generator. The, the generator is about to come. This is the non-generator version. This is an example of what the generator is good for. This thing here, we have a problem. We want to count how many words, how many of each word is in a file. Like you could dump a Shakespeare script into this and find out how many times the word wherefore appears or whatever. Um, so we want to open the file, look at each line in the file, split each line into words on white space, and then finally we want to do our default dict counter thing to count how many times those words appear. What I don't like about this function is that the logic of parsing out the file is tangled up with the logic of counting things. It would be cleaner if we could write a function that just does the parsing and was a generator that yielded up the values, the, the parsed out words. And here it is. So the logic is just identical. We write, we open the file, we for loop on the lines, we split the lines and, and get our words, but then we yield them up. So when you, when you run this function, 
it just returns a generator object. And then when you iterate the generator object, then this code runs and pops the values out one at a time. So look at the stuff we can do with this. We can just hand it to counter, and there, counts all the words. We can use it with our generator expression to ch find bad words, and it will, it will check if any bad word is in the file. And it's lazy. It will only read the file until it finds a line with a bad word, and then it will stop. If you had a line with 10 million, if you had a file with 10 million lines, and there was a bad word on the first line, it would read the first line and just stop. Um, and we can use it with, with sum. There's the version I promised where it doesn't matter if the, 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 the string numbers are one per line or multiple on a line. This will, the read words will parse them out for you. So read words is a handy thing to have in your toolbox. Um, and you can do a lot with it because Python lets us separate things with generators. <laughs> We're separating the logic of the parsing from what we want to do with the parsed things. And I think that is elegant. I love it. Now, you can even write a generator that uses a recursive algorithm. So I don't want to snow anybody. I don't want anybody to go, oh my gosh, this is all weird tree traversal stuff. Um, if, if this is too weird, just let it wash over you. Um, but I was just stunned when I realized you could make a generator that would traverse a tree for you in, in the order you want. So let's, let's here's the example. We're going to have um, a binary tree of a simple form that represents simple math expressions. So the binary tree is going to be made up of nodes. And the node will store an operator. And then it'll have left and right. And left and right will either be another node or a number. So if we wanted to, um, here's, here's, here's an example of an expression turned into a binary tree. We have a sub-expression of 1 plus 2, and then that's its own node object. We have another sub-expression of 3 plus 4, and that's its own node object as well. And then we have a node object that has the multiply operator with those two nodes as its children. And so this represents, this binary tree represents the expression. The two are kind of equivalent. And as a little helper function, because there's room on this slide, I, I, I added echo here, which just prints something with a space after it. So here is tree traversal, not with a generator. We're going to traverse the tree in prefix order and echo the stuff as we go with our little echo function. Prefix order means first we print the operator, the, the, the root of the node. And then we try to visit the left. And trying to visit the left means if the left is a subtree, we, we recursively do that. And if it's a value, we just echo the value. So we're recursively calling ourself if we have a subtree. And if we don't, we just echo the value. And then we visit the right, which is the exact same thing, only on the right. So this here will print in prefix order. So it will print um, star plus 1, 2, plus 3, 4. But again, it's tangled up. This is only for echoing, only for printing. Oh, yeah, here's my slide where I show what it prints. But here's the same thing rewritten as a generator. And now we, we've, we've removed the, uh, the printing logic and just made a generator that gives us the stuff in the correct order. So first, we yield the operator. Then if we have a subtree, we do yield from, which is a Python feature that lets us um, delegate the yield to a recursive call you know, or to some other call. Um, not every version of Python has that. I'll show you how to get around that in another slide. But for now, just go with it. So instead of a recursive call, because it's generated, we have to use yield from. But this here walks the tree in prefix order. Uh, and also, um, because all I'm going to do with this is just print it, it's convenient to uh, coerce the, the numbers to strings. For a real program, you wouldn't do this. You'd have a more complicated print function, and uh, you'd probably just have the values popped out with what they are. But anyway, so here's prefix. So prefix is operator, then visit left, then visit right. Here's infix. Infix is visit left, then operator, then visit right. 
And so this would, would yield up the tree values in the familiar form that we're used to, like 1 plus 2, 3 plus 4, and those with a star in the middle. And then, of course, postfix. Visit the left, visit the right, print the operator. So here is the example that shows calling those. So I don't know about you, but I was just stunned the day I realized you could do this. Tree traversal is always you know, kind of this wacky thing in languages like C. You have to write a different function. Uh, you could maybe write one that takes a callback function so it does all the work of visiting it and calls the callback function as it goes. But here, we can just hand them to join and join joins them. Or we could just put them in a for loop. You know, um, you could do counter to count how many times. I mean, just anywhere an iterator could go, you could do this. So traversal is now completely abstracted. It's amazing. Oh, I'm running out of time. OK, that's how you do it without yield from. 4x in the generator yield x. Um, Context managers, got to talk fast. Context managers, you use them when you have setup and teardown. They do the setup and the teardown for you. Or maybe you only have teardown, maybe you don't have setup. So the top example shows the proper way to open a file and make sure it's closed if you don't have a context manager. You have to use try finally to catch any exceptions that might be raised and to make sure that the close gets called. With the with statement is the context manage, is the way you use the context manager, and file handles are context manager objects in Python. Um, so this works. So here's another example. We might want to remove a file. We might get a file not found exception. The top shows how to catch the exception and then just say pass to let it go, not, not, not do anything. The bottom shows how you can use the suppress uh, context manager to suppress that exception. Um, I have an example of making your own. Since we're running out of time, I'm going to whip through this. Um, I, ne I need to figure out, I don't know if there's a place for Linux Fest to, to put the slide decks. Um, yes, there is. Yeah. Okay, wherever that place is, I will find it and this slide deck will go there. <laughs> so you can, you can look later. Um, so here's an example of writing your own. Basically, there's a special method function of enter, which is called for entering. And there's a special method function exit, which is called with information about the exception type, the exception value, and the exception traceback. If there was no exception, then um, you, I think those are all set to none. And um, so here, this is similar to suppress, but it's for, it's for Python 2.x, where everything returns OS error, and you have to use the error number to disambiguate. So OK, moving on. Um, I want to finish up with decorators. Decorators are a cool thing. In the example, we make a function, and we function gives us a function object. We can pass it to some decorator, and some decorator will wrap it and make a new function that wraps the old function and give us back a new function object. And then we can bind the name my function and now have this new function object that wraps the old one. Well, the at sign syntax lets us do this in one step. We can specify the decorator and then define the function, and then Python will automatically do the same thing that the first line shows. It will call the decorator, passing the function object in, let it be wrapped, and pass it back to you. Um, so I explained that there to show you that you can make your own context manager using this contextlib.contextManager method function, which is a decorator. You just write your function that you want to be a context manager, and you put the keyword yield into it, and whatever you put before the yield will be the start method, and whatever you put after it will be the uh, exit method. So you can, this one here, start, records start time, records stop sign, and writes to the log with elapsed time. Um, and finally, I show you how to write a simple decorator. This is something which you can find all over and blog posts, so I didn't want to go into the full details. Um, but here, here's our decorator. We're going we're gonna to call it log execution time, and immediately it starts defining a new object to return, and the new object's going to wrap the function that's passed in. So the wrapper function starts the timer, you know, records the start time, I should say, 
And then it calls the passed in function, which it's going to hang on to. It's going to keep a copy of that function object, or keep a reference to it, I should say. Um, and then after that call is done, it logs the elapsed time, and then it returns the result. So there's our wrapper function, and we can return the wrapper object. And then if you put an, an, if you put, uh, an ampersand on, or a, an at sign on this, it will decorate a function, and it will do the logging. It's best practice in Python to use the wraps. Wraps is the decorator decorator. When you write decorators, you wrap them with wraps. Uh, and the reason you do this is because if you just use this, if you check the name, you'll notice that the name is handy. I'm using fn dot underscore underscore name underscore underscore to get the name of the function that was passed in. The name of the wrapper is my wrapper. Every, if you use this wrapper, every function object would now have a name of my wrapper. And if you wrap the function with a doc string, it no longer has a doc string because I didn't bother to write a doc string here. So the, the at wraps fixes that. The at wraps copies the name out of the wrapped object and it copies the uh, decorator or the, the doc string out of the wrap. Um, and finally, this is why I love decorators. We, we can optionally have the logging. We can actually even check an environment variable. If the environment variable is set, we're going to use our decorator we just created. And if it's not set, we're going to use a do nothing decorator. And the do nothing decorator just gives you back the same function object without changing it at all. Now, you can use this logging um, decorator all through your code and do a whole bunch of logging, which takes a whole bunch of time. And then you just don't set the environment variable. Without changing a line of code, you get it for free. The, the logging goes away. So I'm over time. Um, I'll take questions if, if you guys have any. Yes? I didn't have a question. Yes. So these are, I admit, these are really elegant. It's really good, but I don't see where you're doing any runtime type check consistency. Um, so, I mean, it's, you're using simple examples. I understand that. But if you get 100,000 lines of code or even a million lines of code into something, how do you know your container is filled with all the same objects? Um. So that's another talk, but basically Python is strongly typed. If the objects have the wrong types, you get an exception. You have to catch those exceptions if you're running to be reliable. So there is no runtime type checking. That is correct. Uh, there's languages like Scala, which are similar to Python, but have static types. Okay.